Hello guys and welcome to another video. First and foremost I want to say thank you to anyone who left a comment or a thumbs up under my last video about Holland. I'm such a small channel that any kind of feedback I'm getting is very precious for me. Right now we are closing in on the insane number of 50 subscribers. So if you enjoy my content please leave a like under the video and maybe even consider subscribing. So you might have been wondering about the thumbnail, what's up with Des Moines in 2021? Well, the match that I'm about to show you has been recorded recently and is a good example of how to play Des Moines in the current meta. And since people usually search for recent guides on YouTube, I figured I might as well pretend my video has been recorded in the future and 2021 is right around the corner anyway. And then there's the title in the intro, but I'm not gonna spoil anything here, so if you want to know more about the so-called costly mistake, you probably need to stick around or just fast forward. No, please don't. So let's get finally to the match. We are playing the tier 10 American heavy cruiser Des Moines on the map Greece. And while I really dislike Greece when I play battleships or destroyers, it's actually a great map for cruisers with floaty shell trajectories because of all the islands near the capture zones that provide cover and can obstruct the line of sight to your enemies. And as we all know, Des Moines has basically the floaties arcs of them all. However, it's a CV game and there's a Hakuyu in the enemy team. Her AP bombs are posing a very lethal threat for a stationary cruiser, so we definitely need to keep an eye out for any planes that are coming our way, especially since we are not equipped with the defensive AA fire consumable, but instead opted for hydroacoustic surge. Let's have a quick look at my commander build and my upgrades here. For me it's basically a standard cruiser build, although I know many people like to have radio location on their Des Moines. I'm using one of the Doe brothers, so I definitely want to take advantage of the enhanced expert loader and expert marksman skills, but it leaves me one point short of the required four points for radio location because I don't feel comfortable playing without priority target. And despite being up in arms against survivability expert on cruisers for many years, nowadays I just dump my last three commander points into SE because there aren't really any other useful three point skills in my opinion. I'm not saying it's the best build, but it works best for me. So back to the match. I spawned on the eastern flank and took a slow approach to the cap because I wanted to see what my opposition looked like first before committing. We are accompanied by an Östergötland and a Georgia, although our DD already lost half of her HP to rocket planes and seems to be retreating. With two Thunderers, an Iowa and the CV on the opposing side, we definitely cannot afford to be the closest ship to the enemy without cover, so I waited for the Thunderer on the outermost right hand side to shoot and then started to turn away from the cap. Now we are in relative cover, facing away from the enemy and meanwhile the Baltimore on the other side has been doing the exact opposite of what you want to do as an American cruiser, sailing around in the open and exposing her broadside to several enemy ships. With a little bit better aim we could have punished her really hard for her reckless play. We are now basically in the perfect position to stall the enemy push, so I'm reversing and start to take pot shots at one of the Thunderers. I will be completely stationary in a few seconds, because I want to bait the Thunderer to shoot me. And as soon as she shoots, I will take advantage of Des Moines unique upgrade that enhances her acceleration significantly and accelerate into cover again. I'm keeping an eye out on my priority target indicator, but luckily it looks like only one of the three BBs is interested in shooting at a stationary cruiser. We take minimal damage from the return fire, however after a few more salvos the Thunderer herself disappears behind an island. Unless she decides to push down the 10 line, I can maintain this position for quite a while. My PT indicator disappears because there are no more ships within my range that have an unobstructed line of sight towards me and with even my rear being covered by an island, we are perfectly set up for the enemy push. There's really no need to be further forward than this, because my BBs are playing quite passively and again, you don't want to be the nearest ship to the enemy when you're playing a stationary cruiser and can get spotted by planes at any given moment. 
After only four and a half minutes, my team takes out two battleships on the western flank in quick succession. And I can promise you that my A division on the other side of the map, composed of a Großer Kurfürst and a Salem, will be pulling their weight. With the Östergötland and the CV spotting for us, we are now in free farming mode and start to rain fire on the enemy BBs. There is not much to do for us right now, besides holding down the left mouse button and managing our concealment to avoid the enemies from spotting us. But because of the planes we will get spotted anyway. I'm switching between the binocular view and the free look mode after every salvo to check my surroundings and watch out for incoming fire that is coming our way. After a little bit of maneuvering, we finally get our first fire after over 5 minutes into the game. I'm trying to switch targets more or less constantly to keep the pressure on the enemy BBs. But since one of the Thunderers left our firing range, the enemy Iowa remains our main target for now. Luckily, the fire RNG is now rolling more in our favor and we get another fire on the Iowa. Unfortunately, the advancing Thunderer on D8 is about to spot us and combined with the occasional CV spotting we are forced to increase the distance to the enemies a little bit further. But as long as the Hakuryu does not decide to attack us directly, we can still hold our ground. By the looks of it, the Iowa immediately put the fire out, so we keep spamming HE at her, hoping for sticky fires after her damage control party consumable runs out. One unrepairable fire is already burning on her stern and I'm not gonna lie, we get incredibly lucky with the next few salvos and set three unrepairable fires in total to her. The Iowa does not seem to be very happy about it and tries to retaliate with an armor-piercing salvo of her 16-inch guns, but we turn away from her and manage to mitigate the damage almost completely. Now it's time to switch our attention to the full health Thunderer that's sitting in the Charlie cab. In the meantime, our Kitakaze in the west has secured Alpha with the help of the Kurfürst and the Salem, and the three of them are now proceeding to push into the enemy spawn, taking out the Hindenburg in the process, one of the two tier 10 cruisers of the enemy team. However, this can be a dangerous endeavor, because there seems to be an enemy Sir Goodland on their left flank, as their pings on the minimap indicate. There's also an Alsatio and a Yugomo in the Bravo cap, and the two of them are about to take down our Sian Yang, and after losing our Republic as well, the teams are almost even again. Though there's not much we can do about the events on the other side of the map, because we still have our hands full farming the BBs near the Charlie Cap. At this point, our damage numbers have risen to 160k and we secure the Witherer achievement after 8 minutes, but it doesn't really seem to discourage one of the Thunderers from pushing further towards us. Pushing into a hidden Des Moines when you're covered in 32mm plating is really the last thing you want to do as a BB, not to mention the two other BBs and our Öster Gütland that's still sticking around despite being harassed by the Hakuyu for almost the entire game. We briefly lose spotting on the Thunderer and get spotted ourselves in return and we will be targeted by two ships. But we move forward and as soon as the planes die, we are concealed again. Nonetheless, the positioning of the Iowa on D10 is becoming more and more dangerous for us, since we are exposing our broadside to her. So I decide to turn around and try to maintain an angle that keeps me relatively safe from both the Thunderer and the Iowa. This means we can only use our back turret for roughly the next 30 seconds, so I decide to switch to AP since the Thunderer is burning in three places anyway. It's really surprising to see how many BB players are still not using fire prevention, but maybe their commanders just don't have enough points. The Thunderer seems to have realized her mistake by now and is beginning to turn away, but as you can tell it's already way too late for her to disengage. We will finish her off, which will give our team the points lead once again and additional good news are that my team is about to secure the Bravo cap as well. 
The bad news are that our position is now compromised because of the Yugumo that tag teamed our Xian Yang with the Azashio and Bravo a few minutes ago is now spotting us from the middle of the map as soon as we open fire. Looking at the score and the remaining ships on the opposing side, you could be deceived into thinking that this match is already over and it's basically time to mop up the floor with the remnants of the enemy team. This was exactly my thought process, so I'm happily leaving my island, trying to close the distance to the remaining enemies. But after all, this is World of Warships and the match is not won until you see the word victory on your result screen. You could even accuse me of reckless behavior myself, since it looked like I was exposing my side to the Iowa, but I counted on my ability to dodge, since Iowa's shells have quite some travel time from 16 kilometers away. And for some reason she didn't even shoot at me, but targeted the Yamagi behind me instead. Well, now she's obviously targeting me, but since she has just repaired a single fire again, we won't leave her be. And conveniently, another island is breaking line of sight to me again. So now we just need to hit our shells and maybe hope for a sticky fire. Although at this kind of range, it's not that easy to hit your shots unless somebody moves in a straight line. In the meantime, our A division went down, but fortunately the Salem managed to kill the Yugumo that was spotting me with her last salvo. I'm constantly keeping an eye out for the situation in B, and unfortunately our Kitakaze is about to go down to an airborne torpedo. Our CV on the other hand is keeping the Iowa spotted and already got a fire on her superstructure, and with me getting a second fire, Iowa's fate is finally sealed. This is going to turn the game into a quite comfortable 5 vs 3 and I'm not sure if you've noticed it, but we've stacked up over 240k damage already and I distinctively remember that I was contemplating at this point if I could go directly for the enemy CV while conveniently capturing Charlie on the way and just ignore the Thunderer and Bravo. In hindsight, this would have been a big mistake though, since I really didn't have any confidence in the remaining ships on my team and their ability to deal with the Thunderer on their own. My Turpets and my Amagi have been playing on the I and J line for the entire game and only pushed up now when the game was seemingly over. And there's also the enemy DD that has been lastly spotted at C3 and is about to enter the Alpha Cap. Actually, the DD is already in the cap and the Thunderer will obviously be trying to capture Bravo so we could potentially be on the back foot again in less than a minute. The Thunderer player got the Confederate achievement a few minutes ago, so it seems like he knows what he's doing and with him being in my flank it's incredibly risky to continue my path towards the CV. I finally make up my mind when the Hakuyu's rocket planes eventually spot me and turn towards the Bravo cap to protect my left side from the Thunderer. This means exposing my right side to the rocket planes, but taking 5 or 6k damage from the planes is definitely the better deal than getting death struck by the Thunderer. And it turns out that the Hakuyu decides to strike the Östergötland next to me anyway. With the island in front of me, I could try to get into a position where I can only use my front turrets against the Thunderer and maybe even stay concealed as long as the enemy CV doesn't spot me. But with so few ships alive, I don't want to rely on the mercy of the Hakuyu and the fact that she's been focusing other targets until now. The tier pit spots the Thunderer and Bravo for us and we start firing, but she goes dark after a few salvos so we use our surveillance radar consumable to keep her lit. She cannot spot us back in return yet, because the edge of the island between us is just high enough to obstruct the direct line of sight between the so-called detection points on the center of our ships. I'm counting on the fact that I'm faster than the Thunderer and I'm hoping to keep the island between me and her, but she's faster than expected and catches us basically completely broadside. We get lucky and don't get deleted outright, but we're now caught pants down in front of the Thunderer that overmatches us anywhere. As long as she isn't reloaded, we can use our back turret to apply as much damage as we can. Meanwhile torpedo planes are coming in from the right and we set our priority sector a little bit prematurely and angle in as soon as we see the 18 inch shells coming our way again. This salvo was not as disastrous as the salvo before, so we quickly angle out to use our back turret again and kill the Thunderer before she can shoot once more. 
We catch one torpedo, but with us being alive and the Thunderer dead, the game is now 99.9% .9 in the back, right? But hold on, our Tirpitz goes down to the enemy of Sir Goodland, and shortly after that, the Hakuyu somehow manages to kill our Sir Goodland with torpedoes. Okay, let's pause the replay for a second and recap what just happened. Me getting caught by the Thunderer was indeed the costly mistake that I mentioned in the intro, since with me being dead and the Thunderer being alive instead, which definitely was within the realm of possibility, if you consider how much broadside I was exposing, I can absolutely see the chance of my team somehow losing this game, and to be honest I still do. I don't know if you've caught it, but our Ursa Goodland managed to miss every single torpedo on a BB that was basically stuck in a narrow channel. The enemy Ursa Goodland, on the other hand, has just proven that her torpedo marksmanship is more pronounced by killing our Tirpitz and Bravo. So it looks like we have one last mission to accomplish before we can finally call it a day, and that's killing the enemy DD that will most likely head for the Bravo cap within the next minute. I miss out on the chance here to catch a glimpse of the enemy CV's HP pool while she's spotted by planes, and this would have helped to better assess the situation and the urgency of killing the Ursa Goodland. But as long as the Hakuyu is alive, we are still only two casualties away from a possible defeat. And if you think about it, it only takes an unlucky detonation on the Amagi and a valiant torpedo rush by the Swedish Tier 9 destroyer to turn the tide in favor of the enemy team. I got briefly detected here and you are about to witness my literal visible confusion because I'm going to turn my guns to my starboard side in a moment only to turn them to my port side again a few moments later. How could the Öster Gütland possibly detect me? Based on her torpedoes on the Tirpitz, she must have been to the southwest of the Bravo cap when launching them and should have gone in a straight line into the cap. Or did she maybe make a U-turn and is now somehow northward of Bravo, with the islands to my right blocking line of sight? No, this can't be right. Fortunately, my surveillance radar consumable is going to be available in a few seconds and combined with my active hydroacoustic search, we should be able to put an end to the mystery very soon. It turns out that the Ursa Goodland is just about to enter the Bravo cap when we catch her in the most unfavorable position with plenty of leeway to dodge incoming torpedoes after we come around the corner and no place to hide for the DD. Our 8 inch shells catch her completely off guard with devastating effect and she's about to launch her torpedoes in a desperate attempt to kill us without even firing her main guns. I slow down beforehand and accelerate as soon as the Swedish destroyer launches her torpedoes, but to be frank, Des Moines' unique upgrade is not as good as it used to be and the acceleration is not quite enough to dodge torpedoes that are homing in on you with the speed of light. However, we only ate two of them and since pan-European torpedoes are notorious for dealing underwhelming damage, we remain afloat. With the Ursa Goodland being killed, we made it into the magical 300k damage territory and now there's not much to do for us except watching our Amagi and the Midway chasing the Hakuyu into the corner of the map. It even looks like the Amagi is about to go down and by having a look at the chat window you can tell I'm kinda surprised of how much damage we dealt this match. Conversely, the Amagi manages to kill the enemy CV with her last salvo, so the match finally comes to an end and we can have a look at the result screen. 312k damage, 4 kills, the arsonist, dreadnought, witherer and high caliber achievement. This was one hell of a ride and only my third game ever where I managed to surpass the 300k threshold. We end up on the top of the leaderboard with roughly 3300 base XP, but as you can see our Salem also contributed a lot to the match despite already dying after 10 minutes, so I'd like to give a big shout out to this guy. The detailed report then reveals the source for all this damage. We basically dealt 100k damage each to both Thunderers and the Iowa was kind enough to grant us 75k additional damage with her repairing one fire policy. Lastly, the credits, nothing unusual here since we were not using a lot of economical flags. So that's it for today guys. I was really excited to share this game with you and oh boy what a game it was. 
Maybe you noticed a slight difference in the commentary today, since I actually prepared a script for it, which took me days. So I would like to know your opinion about this kind of commentary. Do you like it or do you prefer an approach that resembles more a live commentary? Please let me know what you think about the video in the comments and if you enjoy my content, feel free to drop a like and maybe even consider subscribing. Thanks for watching, I hope to catch you next time and see you soon.